don't hold back. Like you, you just have to get like it, it's okay. Like if you know someone says something and it leads to a silly joke, make the joke. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Mm. But no one's ever suffered from trying. What's going on guys? It's your boy Tom Talk Trash and stand back for another video. It's time. I'm joined by the one and only Ryan from the Mark Order podcast. So welcome to the show. Thanks, Tom. How are you doing today? I'm good. I'm excited to chat with you, my friend. So speaking of that, if we take this back to the beginning, where do you first discover wrestling as a fan? So I first discovered wrestling in the year 1995. Mm -hmm. I am a eight-year-old boy i'm trying to remember my age so that was pretty bad mm -hmm. um and i saw it, it, there was two things going on at that time i saw sting in wcw Ooh. and i saw Shawn michaels in in wwe and in in wcw they were doing a storyline where they had it was actually kind of funny when you think about the forbidden door coming up but they had uh starcade 95 which was new japan pro wrestling versus wcw for the world cup of wrestling and that's the first pay-per-view i ever saw and i loved it and then at the same point, you had the Owen Hart, Shawn Michaels concussion storyline in WWE. Ooh. And that was my first like foray into a storyline. Mm. And I was hooked. Like those two things just were amazing to me. So you talked about there being hooked on really two different perspectives of wrestling, like the promotional side with the WCW New Japan and the more story aspect with the WWF side. So if I said to you now, which side do you prefer? Like the dream matches that, I'll be honest, we would have got at Forbidden Door because this will go out after Forbidden Door uh, or the more storyline orientated side. What side hooks you more? So I still, I think I'm more still story a little bit, but not quite. I like, not just because I host co-host an AEW podcast. It's also because... I prefer AEW's method of telling stories a little bit, which is a little more subtle, a little more letting the story breathe a bit. Um, mm. WWE has gotten way better, so I, I got to appreciate it, but they sometimes can be a little heavy-handed in their storytelling, mm. uh, and, and that's not what I prefer. But at the same point, just because I lean story, uh, story heavy doesn't mean that I'm upset at all about the dream matches we will have seen at Forbidden Door. <laughs> so let me give you an example. Obviously, we're going to see... Brian Danielson Okada, right? Uh, yep. That hasn't really had any build at time of recording anyway. It, do you not get a bit like, mm, I know this match will be good, but I'd rather, ha do you know what I mean? Like, I know this match will be good, but I want some meat on the bone sort of thing to know. Somewhat. I mean, I will say of the matches called, I prefer uh osprey versus omega because not only will it be a great match it has that story that they've been yeah. telling with each other that being said i i know who okada is like i followed new japan enough to know who okada is i obviously know who uh brian danielson is so i've kind of i think like fans have done we've built the story up in our own head of like it, it hasn't been told on screen but we know in our own head that this is just two of the best ever trying to determine who's the best that's a very good point. So you talked about there, obviously, being a lover of promotion and story. So you talked about there when fans build up stories in their heads sometimes. Do you think that can be a good thing? but Or do you think that can be a detriment to the match itself sometimes? Um, it's, it, it's really dependent. I, there's, there's times in wrestling where fans have fully determined that something is supposed to happen, and it mm -hmm. doesn't happen. And there was never any indication that it should have and it ruins what would have been a good moment or match because they've decided that this other thing should have happened. Mm. But there's other times where if they hadn't, you know, uh, and I I'm blanking on an example and it actually, it's, you know, um, there was a, there's been some ones in AEW where they've done it, where fans have said, this is going to go this way and it didn't, but, but at the same point, if fans don't do that, then are they like, you're limiting interest. You know, yeah. fans, it happens in movies, it happens in TV shows where everyone tells the story after the cameras turn off, they tell their own story of what's happening in between. So if you don't go that route, 
you're limiting interest. I think the problem actually comes into effect, and AW is one hundred percent guilty of this, is when you give enough hints that you're you're telling a story, and then you don't. And mm. the Mercedes Monet is the perfect example. They dropped enough hints about her, the fans built up in their head that she was going to show up, and then she didn't show up. And it's they should have never played into fans' natural inclination to build up these wonderful stories. They should have just ignored it completely. So the, I think the real problem is when they do it, them they lean into it. Mm, the opposite of example of that being not his return, but his debut in AEW. They dropped enough hints for CM Punk without it being uh, overly over the head that you were still surprised. Exactly. They let fans' natural inclination to tell stories take over by dropping hints, but they delivered on what they hinted on. Mm. You have to deliver. After the end of the day, you can't – if you don't deliver, you start destroying the trust between fans and promotions because now it's – I don't trust anything you tell me or hint mm. to me, I should say. You talked about there, obviously, not trusting the thing. So we understand you got into wrestling in 1995. Where do you go once you start discovering wrestling? Where do you go from there? How do you start consuming everything, etc.? Because the segue was going to be, has a promotion ever lost your trust? To the point that you stopped watching for a while. Well, I I did stop watching wrestling. So I watched wrestling from ninety five till two thousand one ish, um, and it had nothing to do with the promotion losing my trust. Truthfully, I went into high school and got interested in in, in, in girls and and didn't think they would be interested in me watching wrestling. So tried to be cool, even though I would if I saw Shawn Michaels on, I'd watch. If I saw Sting on, I'd watch. Like I saw some TNA stuff, had no idea what was going on, but Sting was there, so I would watch those segments. But funny enough, I got back into wrestling in the mid like before AEW started, maybe a year or two before AEW started, because of my co-host Kate. She hmm. she knew I liked wrestling as a kid. I read all the wrestling books even when I wasn't actively watching. Like I was still very much a fan. I just had not brought myself back. And she's like, well, there's a Royal Rumble coming up. You love Royal Rumble, and I do. It's my favorite pay-per-view that's ever been. And she's like, just give it a watch. And the net I had bought the network just to go back and watch classic matches. I hadn't watched mm, anything I new. did that as well. And so I started watching. And so she got me back in, and she then started showing me indies. And at the same time, I started watching some New Japan stuff when Elite was there. And then AEW started. And that was the best thing that could have ever happened for me because I was able to watch something from the beginning all the way through and not feel like I'm missing part of the story that's being told. Mm, I know exactly what you mean. So how exactly did AEW save your fandom in that perspective of being able to start from the beginning and then being the current day almost? So I am a, like, I guess this goes back to your one question about story versus, uh, you know, dream matches. I'm a story guy. I like to know the whole story. I like to understand every reference. I like to to feel like I've gotten the complete picture. And when I got back into WWE, obviously, obviously I understood every time they referenced something that happened between 90. Actually, go back a step. When I got into wrestling at 95, my dad had a friend who gave who was a tape trader basically and gave me a tub full of old wrestling tapes. Ooh. So I got to see basically everything WWE at that time, WWF produced basically from the 80s until 95. So when WWE references anything from the 80s to 2001, totally understand the reference. Doesn't I struggle sometimes when they go in the mid 2000s and I'm like, I, I don't know what this is in reference to. And that just and it's a personal thing. It's not their fault, but that bugs me. I don't have that issue with AEW because AEW is its own story. So it allowed me to get more into it because now I feel like I'm not missing aspects of a story that I otherwise want to know you know i know they sometimes reference stuff they've done elsewhere but there's enough maybe it's because the fans of AEW are desperate to tell you what they're referencing that i always find out what what i'm missing mm. so you talked about there as well being able to reference anything from the 80s to 2001 in wb is there anything you've gone back and watched from your gap to say 2001 2017 that you're like oh man i wish i was a fan during this like i wish i'd watch this and then it, what is something that you're like okay i understand why i wasn't watching during this point so i'm pretty sure basically anything from 2009 to like 2015 i'm not upset that i missed um mm. because they were just 
there's some wrestlers I wish I had seen, but they were some weak years of wrestling. Uh, 2001 to like 2008, it's hit or miss. I w- I'm sad I wasn't watching when Shawn Michaels made his return. I did watch specific things, but you don't get the same feels of like you're really into it. Uh, mm. But at the same point, Ruthless Aggression does not age very well. No. They, people, people talk about the Attitude Era not aging well. I think Ruth, Ruthless Aggression is worse if you really go back and watch. Like they oh, really, yeah. So... I'm not upset that I didn't, but I am upset that I didn't get to see like Eddie Guerrero in my mind will always be Eddie Guerrero WCW. Like that's what I saw when he was competing for the cruiserweight or the United States championship. I never got to truly enjoy the Eddie Guerrero as the main eventer. So like, that's an area that I regret. I never like Chris Jericho to me will always have been WCW into early WWE. I didn't get to see much of his main event run until later on. And I'm a big Chris Jericho fan, read his books, think they're great. So those are the things that I'm, I'm, I'm sad that I, that I have gone back and watched and I'm very glad I get to go watch them now, but I'm also a little sad that I didn't get to see them in the moment and be like, this is I'm watching like some, some of the best ever do it live because again, and even now though, even though I've gone back and watched them, if I think of Eddie Guerrero, if I think of um, Chris Jericho, I am WCW all the way. Like that's just Mm. where my brain goes with them. Mm, I totally understand that. So just quickly, this has been a lot of current talk, but obviously we will be sitting on this for a while. What is uh, your thoughts on Chris Jericho and AEW if you hadn't really seen him since late 2001-ish? I So when I saw he joined, I thought it was a great move because I, I knew at that point he was a, like the biggest star they could have grabbed at that time because there wasn't a lot like Obviously now they've gotten punk, they've they've gotten and there's some other stars and Moxley came a little later. But Daniel they needed that. Yeah. But at the time they needed a name. When you start a company, if you go listen to any of the old wrestling, like actually Eric Bischoff's 83 weeks, I listen to it here or there. He does make some very good points about like why he brought Hogan in, why he brought some guys in. So you need a name. You need a name. Advertisers know you need a name. So Jericho was great for that. I also think Jericho's his feuds go on too long. Everyone in will tell you that he just extends them a slight bit too long. But I think overall, he's been great for the company. I mean, yeah. he loses. People try to pretend that he doesn't put anyone over. He loses all the time to, yeah. to up and coming wrestlers. You know, he put Orange Cassidy over. He let um, actually Andretti win. He just lost to Adam Cole. Twice. He will lose. Yeah, twice. Exactly. He, I he think. has no problem losing. It was twice because uh, technically twice, but it doesn't, it doesn't count. Yeah, yeah. But I take the point. Yeah. Um, because Sammy Guevara called it out on Wednesday. No, you're right, but I think, and I, I after the the drama in the locker room, apparently he was, by all reports from like Sean Ross Sapinel, that he was a good calming factor in that locker room. Which you need, you need, you need guys who kind of understand. And I don't say this as a, a knowledge of wrestling. I just say this from working jobs my entire life. Every job needs someone who understands how to just calm everything down and keep business rolling. Mm-hmm. And he seems to do that. So I'm, I'm, I think it was the best decision they could have ever made. I don't, I'm, I still think he goes back to WWE at some point, at least on like a legends deal to like get, a, get in their hall of fame and do whatever. But I think he's been great. Mm-hmm. I, I shouldn't say I agree because this is your story, but I do agree. I really like Jericho and AEW, but you obviously brought up your wonderful co-host Kate getting you back into wrestling. So how does the Mark Alder podcast start? How do you connect with Kate, etc.? Okay, so first I'll I'll do my connection with Kate and then the podcast. Kate and I are friends all uh, in real life. Kate and I have been friends. Kate went to college with one of my best friends, the guy I went to high ah. school with. So I met Kate when she was in college through him, and we've been friends and became friends. So we text and talk, and she just happened. That's how she knew I liked wrestling because she liked it, and she and we. I would talk to her about like what was going on, even though I wasn't watching, and that's how she got me back into it. The Mark Order started because there's a there's a show, there's a podcast called The Shining Wizards. They've been mm-hmm. doing a, the podcast for eleven years. They're one of the what I consider the old OGs of podcasting and wrestling because eleven years is a long time. Uh, and they have their thing called the Network, and where they have a bunch of shows that are all advertising and related to each other, and they during COVID hit and uh, Matt from the shining wizards was bored. Basically. He's like, I don't know what to do anymore. Cause I can't work. And so Matt and my co-host Aunt money and Kate got together with two other guys who are no longer there to do this, uh, just a secondary show on the shining wizards for the Mark order for, for the AEW. And it, they just kept doing it and they had a lot of fun. 
So that's when they decide, well, we're going to brand this as the Mark Order. No longer will we just be a bonus show. We'll actually brand it. I come in because I happen to be watching uh, Dark and Elevation religiously. And I did up until the time they got taken off. They got something being made. And no one else on the, the Mark Order was really watching as much. So I would write Kate and I'd give Kate's notes and be like, here's what happened. Like, here's who looked good. Here's who didn't. And then they just started bringing me on. And, and mm-hmm. then after I got brought on enough and I was filling in as a co-host because Matt, unfortunately, isn't on us or show much anymore because he his job just doesn't allow him to be. And Kate. It has a lot going on too. So they would the need someone to sub in. The busiest person in wrestling media, I'd say. 100%. So they needed someone to sub in. So I would start subbing in a lot and eventually just got brought on full time. So I got brought in by just giving notes to Kate for the fun of it because I was watching the show no matter what. Mm. So you talked about there being the person that created the notes and stuff for Mark Alder. So how did it feel to sort of transition from behind the scenes to, I know, it, in front of the camera, if you know what I mean. How did that feel? Oh, it, it was weird because I am not as, as if you watch our show, I'm a I'm a little weird and crazy on camera. I've worn wigs, I've done the eulogy for dark and elevation. I get strange, but I'm actually, relatively speaking, kind of a shy guy when it comes to being in the spotlight. I I, I am a weird version of impersonal small conversations. I'm very extroverted, but if you get me in a big crowd, kind of turtle shell. Um but so I was a little nervous at first and you get your nerves in the podcast, but then it just felt like I was talking to my friends mm-hmm. and I love that because I love just talking to people about wrestling that I really, really enjoy. And I get made fun of because I'm the positive one. There's <laughs> very few things that I watch that I don't like because otherwise I wouldn't be watching it. And it's just really fun for me to be able to go on there and end up talking to my friends about wrestling that I just watched that I thought was awesome. So it was a weird adjustment. It took a lot long time to, to not be, nervous when i'm on camera now i don't really care you get me Uh, but at the same point and i would say this i don't know if this has been the truth for you the same for you but at least for me in my life i think it's actually and i would tell the same it's been a huge help you get more confidence you get a little bit more uh you get a little less shy you're a little more okay with yourself because you are Mm -hmm. on camera people are watching Mm -hmm. you and you 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 speak Mm -hmm. i fully agree just to a quick story i used to hate the word no as a kid do you know what i mean but if, yeah. for reaching out to people and getting the getting no's and like stuff has helped me understand that no isn't such a bad word. Do you know what I mean? That's one yeah. thing podcasting has definitely helped me. And it's not person. And no's aren't always person. There's the I think the and uh, podcast. Look, we haven't gotten into a lot of interviewing yet. Uh, hopefully we do. But but we've gotten our no's from other things and. And look, my job, and I don't really want to go too much into my shoot job, but my shoot job has involved a lot of news for what I have to do. Yeah, yeah. And I think when you're young or you don't know, you take it very personally. And then as you get older, you start to realize it's not personal. People got a lot going on. It has nothing to do with you. It's just some things don't fit in their life. Mm, yeah, I fully agree with you. So you brought up there, obviously, you discovering wrestling in 95. And based on my interview of the good lady, Kate discovering wrestling in 2009. So how did that help? How does that help your podcast? Because she sort of, uh, actually, I don't want to lead the question. How does it help the podcast coming from two different sort of eras? Yeah, well, there's a, th- and I don't want to describe them. There's a third, there's Ant, who's on our podcast. Ah, Ant, sorry, I do apologize. Yeah, no, that's fine. Because Ant, and the reason I even bring that, Ant is the, so I'll just, for anyone curious who hasn't seen us, but there's, there's, Four of us, but really three, because again, Matt kind of unfortunately has to never show up because of work. But Anne is the the driver of the ship. He is the one who does all the setting up, and he's the one who steers conversation. Because Kate and I can go on to some weird rants and some weird mm. places, and Anne has to keep us together. Anne has kind of, if I'm not mistaken, stayed pretty consistent in his wrestling fandom, so he does help bridge the gap a bit. But what's interesting is Kate gets Kate and I have the same issue but at two different time periods that what we know like i can talk about the attitude and early ruthless aggression very early actually i don't know if it ever transitioned over by the time i quit uh watching but i can talk about that period has having lived through it watching it at the moment kate can only talk about her rewatch but at the same point she can talk about 09 to 17 as having lived through that at the moment and i can only talk about that through a rewatch so in a lot of ways it allows we have people on the podcast who 
can relate to someone what it was like when you were watching this live and having to experience the highs and lows mm. while it was actually happening. Because it, it, there is a difference when I'm when I'm watching something on a rewatch, I can just keep going and I know where it's all ending, so I don't care. When you're watching something live, having a really awesome episode leaves you feeling euphoric. Having a really bad episode leaves you feeling down and you don't get that on the rewatch. So we can relate. And Ant, having stayed kind of consistent, is able to bridge the gap of, of explaining to us how he felt during both. Mm. And when Matt steps in, Matt is like a wrestling um, encyclopedia. So he gets to, and he especially gets to focus on a lot of the weirder stuff. Like Matt hosts a show on Fightful Overbook called Bread Club with Kieran about New Japan. Ooh. So so Matt can reference the New Japan stuff that though we all watch, he knows way better than any of us. And Matt was a huge ECW fan. So Matt can bring in that side of things that as much as I watch, EC, I grew up in um, around the Philly area. So ECW was on my TV. I mean, it was a local mm. station, but Matt was a, Matt went to ECW to watch like he was there. So it, it actually helps because it enables one person to tell another person a bit of history. And I think sometimes that helps the, the, the listener understand where we're all coming from when that, that natural conversation comes together. Hmm. I know exactly what you mean there. So you obviously brought up there what everyone brings to that podcast. So obviously you talked about Matt having stepped away for work and personal reasons, but if, but still showing up from time to time, but if any of your co-hosts or your good self said, look, I've got to step away. I don't like wrestling anymore, or I, I just don't have the time to do this anymore. Do you think the podcast would still work if one of the four steps away or is it one of the things where it's like, we can't do this unless we all do it together? It's weird because Matt, if you like, I think it would probably, it would change significantly that I don't know if it would be the same. I mean, it has changed once Matt left. I mean, Matt hasn't left. And I think that's, I want to be fair. Matt is mm. going to, I tried Matt to say Matt, that by the way. Yeah, no, but I even said, I just caught myself saying when Matt left and I'm in my head, he hasn't left. If Matt decided next Wednesday he doesn't have to work because the weather is permitting or you know, and for his case, it's when weather is bad that he's allowed to come on the show. But if he's if he comes on, Matt can come on. It's not like he even has to ask. Matt is part of the show. We want to see what he has to say. Um, but we did change a little bit when he wasn't consistent because again, we lose a little bit of that encyclopedic knowledge. And Matt has been doing this for so long. There's a skill there, a uh, 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 personality that you definitely miss out on. I think. I do think, I don't know how long it would last if we went down to, like, if, if Ant left, it would be a huge change because, again, he he kind of runs the show. And so uh, it would, he, you know, it would, I don't know. That would be a tough one. If Kate left, it would, Kate is, Kate's the star of our show, I guess, for lack of a better term. Mm. Um, so if she left, if she, you know, even I, I'm not the star, but I'm more of just like a fun personality there. I, it might continue, but it definitely would be different because you'd be missing out on something that makes it mm. itself. You know, I think that you see that in podcasts all the time or shows all the time that someone leaves and yeah, it continues, but it's just never the same because there was a reason that it worked when it did. Mm. So also you brought up there like originally like being shy and podcasting, helping you. What was your route? What is your routine for like, getting in the zone to podcast when you're doing Mark Alder. And then what's your routine for coming out of, I don't want to say character, that's the wrong word, but I know what I mean, like coming out of the podcasting zone. So I don't have much of a routine, but I do have a headspace I get myself into. My headspace basically is, I well, explain, I appreciate that on my podcast we have, and I'll include when Matt's there for this one, um, three people that probably know wrestling better than I do, without question, you know. Matt is again encyclopedic. Kate is a student of it. She goes back and watches stuff that I've never, never even considered watching. Um, she asked for people as advice online, being like, "Hey, tell me what's going on." And Anne has been watching the whole time. And Anne is like a trained radio guy, so like he knows the technical. So when I started to when I joined, I understood that I was never going to be the most knowledgeable or insightful wrestling opinion. So I just tried to bring in, I tried to bring a little bit. Well, I am positive. I, I don't fake the positivity. That is who I am. But I bring in the positive and I bring in the silly. So like keep things light and fun because, it, it, you know, it can drag otherwise. 
So what I just remember when I'm thinking about starting, when the show's about to start, I just try to get in the headset of head um, mind frame of don't hold back. Like you, you just have to get like, it, it's okay. Like if, you know, someone says something and it leads to a silly joke, make the joke. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't, mm. but no one's ever suffered from trying. They all suffer from not trying. So that's, uh, for me, it's about getting into the to the, the right frame of mind to let myself be the butt of a joke, for letting myself look stupid, for letting myself because it helps the whole situation out. Um, and truthfully, to embrace the really silly bits that I probably wouldn't have done before I got some, you know, some confidence behind me. Again, I'm I'm not joking when I say I think I have three wigs that I've worn. Uh, one was to make fun of Kate. One was to be a conspiracy theorist. Uh, one's a veil. It's not a wig. It's a veil when I eulogized. Uh, the mark order and i have a i'm playing with it because i can't stop i have a switch comb that i bought because of switchblade jay white but i'm a switch comb mm -hmm. so like i i've embraced these silly things just to be like this is but i wouldn't have done that until i earned some confidence so every time i go into a show it's remember to be silly coming out for me it's just getting rid of the adrenaline rush you know there, <laughs> i don't think people realize there's an adrenaline there's a i, I never knew it like you thought oh, you're just going on talking when you're done it's like when you're done a conversation but no there is a there's a bit of adrenaline. You're, you're you're feeling good about yourself. So for me, it's walk around, calm down, get something to drink, try to try to just relax, which isn't always easy. Hmm. I understand what you're saying completely there. So when it comes to you talked about there, and I want to be fair to you guys, you're the stars of the show of the Mark Order podcast. But you talked about Kate being the star of the show, uh, star of the show at points during this conversation. So how much do you think her work outside of the Mark Holder podcast has helped it to grow, etc., exposure, whatever word you want to use? Oh, it's been huge. So when we started, we got lucky. We had a bit of a built-in fan base because of the Shining Wizards. Um, their fans came over, and that was great. But, you know, the Shining Wizards fans are not just AEW fans. They The Shining Wizards cover all wrestling. So you weren't getting everyone. And we weren't the Shining Wizards. We only had Meg. We were missing... Um, Kevin and, and Tony, who are two amazing personalities over there. So we weren't getting all those fans. So we we, the, we would have stagnated. Kate brought over some of her Fightful fans. Um, I wish she brought them all over because our numbers would be amazing. <laughs> she brought over some of her I Fightful shouldn't fans. laugh. That's me. No, it's it's the truth, um, which has helped us grow tremendously because they they came over for her and then they see us and they see that we we get along and they, you know, not everyone has liked us and some haven't come back, but we, I can, I know the ones that have come back and stay consistent and it's been wonderful. So yeah, she, she, she hypes us up when she's out on other places. And truthfully, it's been beyond just the listeners. It's been a little bit of credibility within the space that we have mm. one of our, actually two of our co-hosts have credibility out there. Matt has interviewed countless wrestlers. I mean, he's interviewed Jericho before, like he's, he's, Thank he's you. had, yeah, he's been around. He's done Omega. He's done them all. Um, and then Kate, currently not just with less with interviews, but more with just within the podcasting community itself. Other podcasters know that like we're not just a couple of knuckleheads who might say something like who are out there trying to make a scene or something. We're real, we're okay people. I guess she's brought us that credibility of being considered okay people, which I'm sure you're familiar with in the wrestling podcast space is not always a guarantee. Yeah, one hundred percent. So one yeah. thing you did, one thing you did bring up here is like, uh, the, obviously we talked about your shyness and stuff. So how do you deal with that? Like at wrestling meet and greets and stuff like that. Does that make sense? Like I can go to them. If you uh, want to know my opinion, it, I will be honest. If you see me at a wrestling show, if you see me at a sporting event, if you, I don't, I don't chant. I don't yell. I clap. When, when mm -hmm. there's an appropriate class spot, but I am not the guy to ever try to get attention on myself. I will in a small group. I will never, if, if anyone watching knows me in a small group, 100%, I'm a clown. But the minute that group expands outside people I know, I am, I, I'll go back, I turtle. So you'll, if you watch me in a wrestling show or, or any sporting event, I am silent. Uh, so I don't do meet and greets. I don't, and that's not me trashing them. I just won't, if I don't know you, I'm not the kind to go up and talk to you. And it's mm -hmm. not a, it, it, and sometimes I feel bad because it makes it seem like I'm, I think there's always the inclination is, is this person being rude or mean or a jerk? And it's like, no, I'm, th this is not against you. This is me. I'm yeah. the type to not go up and talk to you because of my own personal thing. So yeah, that's, and, and then go back to the podcast question. It took me a little while. Once Ant and Matt felt like friends, that's when everything changed. 
mm. for me because once I could feel like they were my friends and, and that I was just talking to my friends, I felt a whole lot more comfortable when I, strangers are always my, you know, my kryptonite, I guess you'd say. Yeah, I understand what you're saying there. So obviously you talked about the fact that you get to work with Kate from Fightful and your two other great co-hosts, Matt and Ant. So how, who in the wrestling media were you like, oh, if they wanted to come on for a show, I would love to work with them, etc. Wrestling media. So obviously one of the, the simple answers has always been you, you, if you can get Sean or someone on there, Sean Ross or something, because, but, and I truly, I don't think I'd want to, if I ever got Sean on, I don't know if I'd, I mean, I'd want to talk some wrestling with him, but I'd want to talk more about his journalism side and how he gets the scoops he gets and the stories he gets and, mm. and how he knows which ones to hold on to and which ones to give up on. Uh, there are, I'm, um, um, you know, the, there's obviously the, the, the Conrad empire, a bunch of those guys that you'd love to have on because they're such fantastic, uh, people, but you know, the, I feel like I'm naming the, the simple ones. I, I think it'd be fun to have someone like uh righteous reg on. I think he, you know, oh, I probably yeah. could, you know, he, he co-hosts with Kate, so it's probably doable, but I just think he's such a great guy or even Phil Lindsay. Cause I don't say even, but those grab city boys were all wonderful. I love grab city. So, you know, there's, and there's, and then there's just people I'm friend like I'm becoming friends with. So like I'd grab any of them on if I could, once we start expanding our now with collision, we're going to have to start expanding our offerings. Um, try to grab all those. Cause there's just, there is a, there are some really good people out there that you, once you figure out who is not a good person and then you figure out who is the good people are great people. So, but if we're going stars, it'd be one of the Conrad people, you know, a Bischoff, someone like that, or, or you then go to again, Sean Ross app, because I think Sean is the preeminent wrestling media person right now. Mm, definitely. Uh, so as we look at wrapping this up, Ryan, we're, because I want to be respectful of your time. And obviously, thank you for a great conversation. We're going to do a segment that I call Generic Questions. Those of you that have seen okay. my interviews will know this is where I ask my guest, Ryan's favorite match, favorite pay-per-view, favorite wrestler's theme song, slash entrance theme, entrance theme, slash tag team, and wrestler. Basically questions Ryan might get asked on social media. So now he'll have a place to be like, I've answered this. Please go watch this. So what's your favorite match of all time? So people are going to trash me because they don't love it, but it's the Iron Man match between Sean and Brett. Okay. At WrestleMania. I loved it. Why does that match speak to you so much? That's when I was the biggest. That was when I was at my height of fandom. Like I, again, that was 96 right after I had started watching. That was the Shawn, That was the culmination of the Shawn Michaels story that started with the Owen Hart head kick and went to winning, winning Royal Rumble and then ended with him realizing the boyhood dream and getting the title. So that that is purely... F- fandom at its highest mm. what about your favorite overall pay-per-view Oof. so this is uh, like the actual pay-per-view or the the style because the, ca- the card I, the card oh because i'm gonna say i love royal rumbles but uh so this is where it, it's tough for me because i have what i consider goldfish bring when it comes to this stuff uh i i am very much a victim to recency bias but i will say the first the one that probably holds the, the best place in my heart is the first, uh, what is it? All out. I think it was, all, yeah, they switched from, yeah, all out where, where they did, um, the very first AEW pay-per-view will always hold a special place. Double or nothing. 20. Oh, is it double or nothing? Yeah. 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 Double or nothing. Is that, the one with Co- is that the one with Cody on it? And Dustin. Yeah. The one where he, he destroyed the chair. Destroyed the chair. The throne, the throne, where you re- oh, destroy the Triple H's the throne. throne. Yeah, that was double. Yeah, nothing. yeah. See, that is it because that was again. It just felt like something to me at that time. So that that's right now it still holds the top spot. It's probably not the best, but it just holds the top spot for me. It's your favorite, and it's your answer yeah. to the generic question, my friend. Uh, what about your favorite entrance theme? Oh, it's Shawn Michaels' "Sexy Boy." Mm. I mean, okay. how, he sings his own theme. How could you hate it? Fair, fair enough. So you spoke about that, why that speaks to you. So what about your favorite overall tag team? Ooh, now tag teams are tough because I do, wait, I do have one. I'm blanking. Why am I blanking on what was an easy question? I, I had this it, before we started talking. I'm like, I know this is going to get asked. Why am I blanking? Mm-hmm. Um, well, it's, it's, it's Legion of Doom Road Warriors overall. But there was a period where if you told me that I was watching Sting and Lex Luger tag up, that was what I was watching. Mm, fair enough. 
So what we do on this show when someone suggests two answers is we fantasy book, Ryan. So if Legion of Doom versus Lex Luger and Sting was to happen anywhere, where is it happening and who's going over? Well, it's happening somewhere down south because it should be on a WCW pay-per-view because that's probably where it actually did happen. So we're going to say it's in Atlanta. Um, we, at this point, if we're doing current companies, it would be AEW because that's more their style and Sting mm-hmm. is an AEW. Unfortunately, the the, uh, the the Legion of Doom Road Warriors aren't around. But then I would say, ooh, who is going over? With AEW, hmm. you could say time limit. Yeah, I mean, tr- truthfully, the Road Warriors were the better tag team. They were the tag team. Sting and Luger were best friends who would team up and then not team up and then team up. I'm going Road Warriors go over. They just beat the hell out of Sting. and, and uh, You put and the Lex current Luger. tag team over. That's a good choice. Yeah. I always, I oh, I will say this for anyone. I hate when tag teams that are established tag teams lose to thrown together tag teams. It drives mm. me up a wall. Mm. I agree. And as we wrap this up, who is your favorite wrestler? It's a tie between Shawn Michaels and Sting. And if I'm fantasy booking it, Shawn yeah, Michaels goes over. Yeah, thank you very much. Where's it happening though? What match is it, etc.? It's on WrestleMania in Philly because they're coming here next year. <laughs> Shawn Michaels goes over Sting. Lovely job. I'm very sad that's not going to happen now. So as we wrap this up, Ryan, the question I end all my interviews on, I believe with YouTube, with podcasting and social media, we're all sort of going to live forever in some sort of very strange way. So what is one piece of content you want to be remembered for? And one that you're like, if the good people could forget that from their brain, I would appreciate it. Oof. There's a lot I wish they could forget. Um, There's a... Forget any time I'm not wearing a wig and remember me for one of the characters I play. That's what I'm mm-hmm. that's what I'm gonna because character works or or the or the eulogy I did for Dark Elevation, because that's where I've actually put like real thought into what I've done. So like that's the stuff I want to be remembered for, the stuff I've actually tried. Um and then you can forget me for everything else because half the time I'm just singing a song that popped into my brain. Fair enough. So as we wrap this up, where can the good people find you and your content? We are the Mark Order Podcast. I'm every Wednesday at 10 15, all things all eat. We are actually going to be doing a special episode this Saturday. Uh, it's looking like it'll be a watch along for Collision at 8, but it could be a post show at 10. It depends on some scheduling conflicts. Uh, fo- follow us on all socials at Mark Order Pod. Hey, it's well worth doing, guys. So if you guys like this video, make sure you like, share, and subscribe to the channel at Tom Talk Trash on YouTube and follow me on Twitter at Tom Talk Trash. And I will see you in the next one. Goodbye now.